Good morning, church. How are you this morning? You're looking very, very good looking. Incredibly, this would be the best looking church in Malaysia, for sure. For sure. <laughs> uh, it's been a great honour, um, as Dr. Daniel says, um, partnering together. How many know that two are better than one when uh, you come together? Because God wants to use us together. And uh, we want to thank um, DUMC and um, Dr. Daniel Ho and his wife Doris for um, partnering with us and helping us and hosting us and, and availing this venue where thousands and thousands of people. Last night, every room was full in this building. And, uh, you know, there was over, around 1,100 people in the overflow rooms. And uh, God just did some miraculous things. And we believe the best is yet to come for Malaysia. Best is yet to come for DUMC in your life. And uh, how good was that offering you gave away? That, oh, I was doing an Australian calculation. You know, ringgit's a little bit more than Australian. And uh, 1.5 million Australian dollars. That, that, is, that is brilliant. You should give yourself a big hand because that's good. But let's get it past five million ringgit. That would be good. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, I bring greetings from the best city in Australia, Melbourne. It's way better than Sydney. And in a few years, they say, in the next five to ten years, Melbourne will be the largest city in, Melbourne, uh, in Australia. Largest city. In actual fact, in the last four years, it was voted the most livable city in the world. Behind Kuala Lumpur, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I bring, bring greetings from there and uh, just love what God... Ha you know, you're, you sit under leadership that is world-renowned. You just don't have a good pastor. You have great pastors. And they are respected all over the globe, you know. Um, first time we ever came to Malaysia, people would say, you need to meet um, Dr. Daniel Ho. You need to meet Dr. Daniel Ho. In actual fact, the first time I came to Malaysia, I spoke at FGA, and um, Dr. Daniel was the other speaker at a young adults conference. And, um, and then every time we've come back, he's been very, very supportive of what is happening because he's a kingdom person wants to see the kingdom of God established around the world, and uh, brilliant. Um, at the end of the service, uh, I'll be speaking from this book today, just a little part of it, called The Honor Key. It has a forward by John, B John Bavir, so just for the forward it's worth getting. Um, and it's a book that God uh, gave me to write. Uh, I, I didn't want to be a writer, but somebody said, you need to write a book on all the stuff you're preaching, and I'm like, it's too much work to write a book, um, but God helped us, and uh, we'll be selling this at the end of the service, and it's all to empower you. Everything we do is about empowering people to make a difference in their world, and, and so I'll, I'll be signing this at the end of the, uh, the service, and uh, you know, I'd like to meet you and uh, say hi. Who would like one of these? You could have it right now. Who would want one of these? Put your hand up. Lady in the second row, Josh, could you give that to her? Fantastic. How many, as, as Dr. Daniel says, I'm a third generation preacher. I actually didn't want to be a preacher. I wanted to be a rock star. And uh, I was a good musician and I was a good sports person. And so I would uh, um, walk into meetings and one of the great gifts that God has given me is the ability to sense his presence no matter where I am. Um, and uh, even as a young kid, I'd walk into a meeting and, and just feel God immediately. But I also had insecurity. I had a lot of insecurity because my dad, he's a famous preacher in Australia. Um, he uh, probably headed up the greatest movement that's ever been in church history in Australia. Um, took a movement from 80 churches to 1,200 churches. And he then, uh, out of that movement, came Planet Shakers and Hillsong and different uh, organizations like that and churches. And so and when he was pastoring his church, he was, helped, um, was involved with helping 25,000 church plants worldwide. 
from Bible colleges to different things. So I was brought up in an environment that was like uh, my dad was a famous preacher. So I didn't think that I could do anything great for God because how could I do anything greater than my dad or even as good? And the devil would come to me and he'd say to me, Russell, you'll never be able to do it. You're, you're insig insignificant. You're nothing. You're useless. You're hopeless. And at the same time, everyone used to prophesy over me. God's called you to be a spokesman to nations and God's called you to do this. And I had this tussle, this fight going on in the inside was the lie of the enemy and the truth of God's word. And I've discovered that every human being has the same tussle, has the same fight. The enemy says one thing and God says another. Facts might say one thing, but truth says another. And so I, I, I grew up in this incredible great house but not feeling worthy enough and the devil would say to me you could never do anything great but one day I had an encounter with God which changed my destiny when I was 17 years of age and I came into agreement with what God said about my life and from there everything changed and so I've been on this journey just to give you a little bit of background about myself Planet Shakers started out as a youth conference and it grew to 30,000 in attendance in Australia. Then uh, um, we, we started recording music in which now millions of people sing. And 11 years ago, God told me to pastor a church. I never wanted to pastor a church. Because when you do conferences, everybody cheers. And when you're a guest, people cheer. But when you pastor a church, you've got to deal with people. And people aren't always easy to deal with. But I, it's the greatest decision I ever made. And uh, in 11 years, our church has grown to over 10,000 people. And we've seen 35,000 people give their life to Jesus in that time. And uh, every year we give around $2 million away to people and missions and different things. And what God has done is we just amazed by it. And I, I remember in my devotional life, beginning to grapple with the thought of the kingdom of God. A lot of people talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom. In fact, Jesus really all he talked about was the kingdom of God. That was his central theme. And so if it's Jesus's central theme, it should be ours too. So the kingdom of God, you know, the, Jesus said the kingdom of God is like, and he would talk about the kingdom of God is this and the kingdom of God is that. And then he would talk about everything he was doing was on behalf of his father. He was, he, what was he doing? He was showing what heaven could look like on earth through a human being. He actually modeled us the way to bring the kingdom of God. And so remember when he was teaching his disciples to pray in Luke 11, they said, they said, teacher, teach us to pray because they were pretty amazed at what he would do. And he said, well, when you pray, say, our father who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Now, that statement we've quoted many times, but it's an amazing thought. God's mission for the church is to release heaven on earth. I don't know about you, but that's, that's a pretty amazing mission. Because you think about this, what is heaven like? Well, in heaven, there's no lack. In heaven, there's health. In heaven, there's freedom. In heaven, there's love, joy, peace. There's praise 24-7. There's unity in heaven. And there's worship in heaven. And so God's plan is for his church, his people, to bring heaven to earth. And God's method for revival to bring heaven to earth is through his church. And so the church should look like what heaven looks like. You think about this, the Bible says that we are citizens of heaven. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty cool thing. I'm not a citizen of hell, I'm a citizen of heaven. So when I die, I go to be in heaven. But the good news is, I can have the resource of heaven at my disposal while I'm on earth. Because I'm a citizen of heaven. But more than being a citizen, the Bible says we're an ambassador of heaven. We're God's ambassadors. That's a, that's a pretty amazing thought. You think about what an ambassador has. An ambassador, an ambassador lives in 
one country while representing another country. That's what our, we do as Christians. We live on the earth while representing heaven. And so I thought, I thought about this one time and I thought, imagine if a, an Australian ambassador, first world country, goes to live in Africa into a third world country. What's, what, how does that work? And I began to think about this and I thought, well, they would live with first world resources in a third world. So they would have the resource of the country they're from at their disposal in the place they're living. It's a picture of we live on earth, which if compared to heaven is third world. And, and God, as an ambassador, we have the resources of heaven at our disposal. But not only that, an ambassador has the military might of the country they're from at their disposal. We have the military might of heaven. We have angels, we have praise, we have prayer, we have generosity, we have giving, we have love, we have forgiveness. It's the military might. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers in the unseen world. We are given military might as an ambassador of God. He backs up his ambassadors with his military power. But not only do ambassadors live in one country while representing another country, but I, I, I begin to look at amba ambassadors and they actually live and work in embassies. Now, an embassy, if I, if I turn into the Australian embassy in Kuala Lumpur, as I step into the embassy, I'm immediately stepping into foreign uh, uh, Australian soil. I might, it might be in the proximity of the country of Malaysia, but now I'm in Australia, in Malaysia. Understand what I'm saying? So, if you go to the Malaysian embassy in Australia or any Malaysian embassy around the world, as soon as you're on that soil, you are now on Malaysian soil. So I begin to think, what's the embassy of heaven on earth? It's the church. See, the church should represent what heaven looks like. So when people come into encounter with church people, they should say, well, I'm now in a different atmosphere. I'm now in a heavenly atmosphere because I'm in the ambassador's world. I'm in their, in their place. And so God wants us to release heaven on earth. So I begin to say, okay, God, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So what's the key to release this? You know, imagine if I gave you a key that would release heaven on earth to see your family, your finances, your friendships blessed, a life full of miracles, healings and breakthroughs, to see generational blessing, to release and receive heavenly inheritance, to have a key for every situation, every need in your life. The key is what unlocks heaven on earth. And I said, God, what's that key? And he said, okay, the first thing you need to ask is what's the currency of heaven? What, what does the currency of heaven operate on? You know, I, I, I like shopping. Who, who likes shopping? Who, who I, I like shopping different to my wife. My wife shops different to me. My wife, if she says, I want to go buy some clothes, I go, marathon day coming. Remember one time we went shopping and... Uh, she said, I want to get some jeans. And now my wife's slender and beautiful and I married up. And, um, and so she tried on, first shop, tried on these jeans and she goes, what do you think? I said, baby, you look awesome. She goes, no, I think I look a little, look a little fat. I said, no, no, you're looking at me as you say that. Um, no, no, no. She says, no, I, I think we should go to another shop. So we go to another shop, and she goes, I go, she goes, what do you think? I said, oh, they look incredible. No, no, I don't really like them. Let's go to the next shop. And then we go to every shop in the mall, and, and if it was in the pavilion, we go to every shop in the pavilion, and then we'll go to another. She says, there's a mall just close to us. Let's go to the other mall, and we go to the other mall, and at the end of that shopping mall, she says, I like the first pair of jeans I tried on. <laughs> We're men, we, we just, we think we're awesome. We just go in there, put it on and go, wow, awesome, incredible. We like things like that. But if I was to go and buy something, I was to say I'm buying a new phone, an iPhone. And as I went, to buy, I went in there and said, oh, I like that phone. And they said to me, 
awesome. That is a thousand ringgit. And I'm like, no, I, no, I'll just have it for free, thank you, and walk out. I'll be arrested. I need a currency to exchange something. Sometimes we come to God and ask him, but we don't have a currency to access what heaven has. So what's the currency of heaven? It's faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we need to be people of faith. And so to access miracles, we need faith. To access blessing, we need faith. To access all that, we need faith. So I said, okay, that's good, God. I, I really enjoy that part. But what is the culture or the environment of faith that I can help around my life that releases my life or unlocks faith? And he said, well, look at the life of Jesus. And I said, well, well, okay, I'll look at the life. He said, look at how he operated. And he said, look at what is contained or connected to every miracle. So I went and I did a study on that. Remember the first miracle that Jesus did? He turned water into wine. Now, if I was God, that wouldn't be the miracle I would choose to announce my son. I would use the raising of Lazarus. Because more spectacular la. <laughs> Turning water and wine, yeah. Dead man come forth. Four days. The new King the King James Version says, and he stinketh. Four days in the tomb, you'd be stinkething. But he uses turning water into wine because it's a prophetic picture of what God wanted to do. It's a prophetic picture actually of, of heaven on earth to take our natural and make it supernatural. Water turned to wine. They ran out of wine. There was shame. To take our shame and bring joy. It, the, the Bible says they best left the best wine till last. It's a picture of in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh because wine is a picture of the spirit of God. And it's a prophetic picture of what God wants to do to take our natural and make it supernatural, to take our ordinary, and make it extraordinary, to take our shame and bring joy and to say, I want to use you to release a ladder rain. And so... There's a, there's a part in that, you know, Jesus is 30 and his mum comes to him and he says, hey, Jesus, they've run out of wine. Can you do something about it? And he makes this statement. He says, woman, my time has not yet come. Now, I tried that on my mum. <laughs> Russell, can you clean the room? Woman... My time has not yet come. <laughs> Russell, can you do the dishes? Woman. Now, my mother was an amazing woman. She believed in the word of God. In fact, she, she could quote the first three chapters of Revelation off by heart. She, we would call her the walking concordance. She would put Bible scriptures in my lunchbox. You know, we had scripture all over the wall on plaques. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, when I was naughty, she'd put, you know, write paper on paper and say, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for it is good. We even had a stick this long with scripture on it. Spoil the rod, spare the rod, spoil the child. On the other side, I need the every hour. And they should have put another one, and Jesus wept. <laughs> my mum, you, you would never say to my mum, woman, my time has not yet come, because if you who had a choice whether my dad would minister discipline to me or my mother, I'd pick my father every time. My, my dad's a softy. One time... He stayed, I stayed away from school for seven days because I felt the call of God to the amusement parks and the... Because uh, <laughs> everyone was saying, you know, go and win your school for Jesus. And I'm thinking, well, what about the, the lost people, the lost tribes of amusement? I had to go to 
them, you know, until this gospel is preached to every tribe. And I thought they have never had the preaching. So I was a missionary and said yes to the Lord. And I would come home from school, uh, from amusement park and she, they would say, how was, in a, you know, arcade places as well. And they'd say, how was school? And I thought, yeah, good. They said, what did you do? And I thought, oh, okay, how do I explain this? There was like a, a game that added up. So that was maths. I said, I did maths. And they said, okay. Oh, and there was a lot of international students, so that was international studies. Um, and there, you know, on the seventh day I came home and my mother said, how was school? I said, it was awesome. She said, well, I got a phone call from the school and they said, you haven't been there for seven, seven days. God did not rest on the seventh day in my life. And she said, wait in the, in the bedroom for your father. So I'm on my knees and I'm pleading with God. God, if you keep this stick from me, I will serve you. Here I am, Lord. You are a good God. You're a gracious God. You forgive our iniquities and our sins. And I come to you and I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. And my father comes in. He's got this stick with scripture on it. And he says, bend over, Russell. And then he says, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. He's crying. I said, Dad, that's not true. You bend over and let's see if that's the case. You know? It's like sometimes parents say to their kids, well, do you want a smack or do you want a belting or do you want a spanking? But what's a kid going to say? Yeah, give me one. No. Woman, my time has not yet come. And then she turns to the servants and says, do what he tells you to do. If you can forget everything I said this morning. Remember this. Ev do what Jesus tells you to do. Because when you do what he tells you to do, you receive what he gave you a vision to do. And so they did what he told him to do. And that could have been a scary thing, taking water to the master of ceremonies. What do you give me this water for? But they did what he told them to do. And, and so here is the first miracle. The second miracle, recorded miracle, is in John chapter 4. And it's there and it's, when it's Jesus there. And he makes this statement. He makes this statement. He says, at the end of two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. And he, he himself said that a prophet is not honoured. Everyone say honoured. In his hometown, yet the Galileans welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and seen everything he had done. That word honour, he's making a statement here. The noble, a nobleman's about to come to him to heal his son, but he's making a statement about honour. If you look at every miracle Jesus did, every miracle has honour attached to it. Everything that Jesus did on behalf of his father was about honouring his father. And so honour has been quoted many times around the world and taught many times. And many times it's, it's one-dimensional how we've taught it. Honour your parents, honour your father, honour your mother, honour honor, you know, your bosses. And that's true. We need to honour all those people. But honour is about not just honouring up, it's honouring alongside, it's honouring those who we serve. Honour is a lifestyle of heaven. Heaven environment is an environment or a culture of honour. It is actually a key that unlocks faith. You say, well, how can you, how do you, how can you prove that? Good question. Gee, I was asking the Lord about this and he said, did I die for the whole world? I said, yeah. I said, you died for the whole world. He said, why don't the whole world come to me? And I thought about that because the word honour means, to, it means um, to revere. It means to value. It means um, to give weight to. And how it used to come out of is they'd get shekels and coins, and the heavier weight they were, the more value they had. So the word honour means what you value. And what you value or you give weight to is what you receive from. So when the servants heard Jesus' word fill up the, the jars, they gave weight or value to what Jesus did, and they were a part of a miracle. 
Jesus is saying, I'm not honoured in my hometown. What is he saying? They don't honour or value or give weight to the gift of what I carry. So they didn't receive from him. So salvation, Jesus died for the salvation of the world. Until the world give weight or value to that, they note receive faith. So people give an opportunity to come to Jesus. Until they value or honour what he has done, they don't receive faith to receive inheritance. What you give weight to is what you receive from. And in this story, in, in, in John chapter 4, a nobleman comes to Jesus and he's walked through the night. His son is sick. He's walked a little way. His son is sick. And there he is and his, Jesus is there and, and he goes to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, um, my son is sick and, and I, I really need him to get well. And, and, and would you come to my house? And, and this is what Jesus said in, in his response to him. And Jesus asked, it, asked him, will you never believe in me unless you see signs, see miraculous signs and wonders? <laughs> now this guy is a nobleman. He is a government official. Jesus is a carpenter. A government official has authority over, over a carpenter. He could have said, don't you know who I am? You come to my house. No, the Bible says, in fact, Jesus, that, that statement sort of could have put Jesus up, put him off because, you know, many times what happens is we honour what we like. We look at the package of what we like instead of looking beyond the package and looking inside. See, this man recognised that God was in Jesus. He didn't know Jesus was God. He just knew that God was in Jesus and so he decided he was going to value the God that was in Jesus and so he could receive what Jesus carried. And you and I have an opportunity every day. Instead of looking at the package that people present, look for the God that's inside of them, the, the, the anointing they carry, the gift that God had given them. Do you know they say of our DNA, 99% of our DNA is the same doesn't matter where you were born, what ethnicity you had, doesn't matter any of that. 99% of our DNA is the same. We have a 1% uniqueness, each one of us, 1% uniqueness. You know what that 1% is? Our eye print, our tongue print, and our fingerprint. Because God gives each person a unique vision, a unique de declaration, and a unique touch. And how I receive a, your unique vision, your in, unique declaration and your unique touch is I honour the gift that God has given you and your uniqueness. And as I honour it, give weight to it, value what I receive from what you carry. But if I get caught up with the package and I go, well, I don't like the package, I'll never receive the treasure. If everyone in church went beyond style and started looking for treasure... See, the Bible says we are, we are treasures in urban vessels. The problem is we get caught up with the vessels instead of looking for the treasure. Hollywood talks about vessels. God looks for treasure. The world is all about what you do on the outside and how that looks. Well, let's make that look glamorous and let's make that all look good. But if you don't look after the inside and you don't value the unseen, your outside scene will die very quickly. If you eat wrong, if you do wrong on the inside, guess what's going to happen? You can paint it, you can cover it, you can do all that. But because of the unseen isn't valued or honoured, the outside will be destroyed eventually. Same in church. You can look at all the scene. How I got to present i got to look good, but we've got to look beyond what we, you know, someone might annoy you and I don't like that about that person. Well, start looking for the things you do like because honour is not highlighting the wrong things, it's looking for the great things. Hmm. Jesus puts him off. Then what does he do? What is the man's response? Did he get an attitude? I'm leaving your church, Jesus. D-U-M-C, I'm leaving Pastor Jesus because you didn't come to my house. If I did that in my church, someone has got a sick son, could you come to the hospital? And I said, would you not come to Planet Shakers unless I attended your son's hospital? They would leave and go for another church because they got offended instead of looking beyond the statement and looking for the treasure. 
What did the man do? The man pleaded with Jesus. And if you look at that word pleaded or begged, it means he humbled himself. It's a picture of prayer as we come to Jesus and come to God and we humble ourselves and say, we cannot do this in our own strength. We honour you because you are greater than our own natural resources. And as we honour God, we receive what God carries. But if you don't pray and you don't humble yourself, we basically say to God, we don't need you. We're reliant on our own gifts and our own talents and our own abilities. We don't need you. So we're God really in our own operations if you don't pray. So Jesus, he says, he comes back to Jesus and says, please, and listen what Jesus says. He says, go, your son will be made well. What is he doing? Jesus, this guy has traveled a long way to come, to come to you, to come and bring you home. What does he do? Jesus says, go. He didn't come for a word. He just came to take Jesus home. I hear people say, if Jesus came to my house, I would believe. But the problem is Jesus went to his hometown and they didn't believe. So what did he do? He said, go. He honoured the declared word. He honoured the word declared through the servant of God. He honoured it. He gave value to it. Okay, 2015. A year of stretching, spreading out, thinking big. That's 2015. You can look at it and go, oh, that's a nice slogan. Or you can say, that's a promise for our church this year. And I'm going to honour that. So stretch me, God. I'm going to honour that. Spread me out, God. I want to think bigger than I've ever thought before. When the sermon gets preached, you say, say, well, let's see what pastor has to say. Or are you like, I'm valuing that. Every year I have a prophetic word like this for our church. One year I said, this is a year of favour. And we taught on Luke 2.52 that Jesus grew in favour with man and with God. And and in that same year, we talked about honouring God with your finances and our giving in the GFC crash, in our giving in the GFC crash, where every church in Australia's money was going down, our church went up 75% in giving. I said at the end of the year, I said, who has had a job, a new job, a promotion, financial breakthrough, um, financial incredible um, blessing this year. 90% of our church stood to testify that God had done that. Why? Because when I declared a year of favour, they didn't sit back and go, yeah, whatever. They said, no, that's for me. They honoured and gave value to. You see, if you sit back and go, whatever, you're honouring whatever. Because in this story, the Bible says... And the man immediately started out. When God speaks to you about a dream or a vision, it's exciting. You know, it's woohoo, awesome, amazing. You know, inside you're excited because, you know, on the outside, I know uh, Malaysians like being excited on the inside. On the outside, um, you're James Bond. <laughs> inside, your, your liver's high-fiving, your kidney and your heart's high-fiving, your... On the inside, I'm bubbling over, but on the outside, you know, I, we got a lot of uh, Asians in our church, and the way I pass to them is I look at what they write on Facebook, because they tell more on Facebook than they tell to you. <laughs> so he, he immediately, he immediately started out. It's exciting when God speaks to you. But we discover in this story, it took it, he had to go through the night to hear the result of the declaration. The Bible says, having us believing, we receive. So where does the moment of receiving come? It comes at the moment of asking. It just takes a little while for the having. It is done in the spirit realm. It's just now I'm walking towards the having. God says, I want to see Melbourne safe. We've asked for that. Now, I've received that, and now I'm walking towards what God has promised, and we have the having. So this is what happened. Uh, he, he spoke the word, and he honoured the word, and he started walking towards the promise. 
but he would have had to gone through the dark of the night. And so many people in the dark of the night stop honouring what God says. You see, what honour does is what you honour is what you walk towards. If you're disappointed, you'll walk to disappointment. See, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If your thinking is angry, your lifestyle is angry. If your thinking is hurt, your lifestyle is hurt. If your thinking is unforgiving, your lifestyle is unforgiving. Because what you think and what you walk towards is what you give weight to. And so it, this is the key to unlock faith in your life. And so he's walking through the dark of the evening and the enemy could be whispering to him saying, you know, it will never happen. You're a nobleman. You came to bring Jesus home. Why didn't, where is he? Where's this Jesus? You go back and get him. No, but he keeps walking through the dark of the night. The Bible says in, in, in Psalms 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, doesn't say, though I camp in the valley of the shadow of death. There is dark times that we go through at times. But what keeps you going through the dark times? You honour what God said. Oh, my family are away from God. Oh, but I'm going to honour you and believe for them. And I'm going to call them in. You honour God, even in your finances. You know, when it gets a bit tight, the first thing shouldn't you get rid of is tithing. In fact, I actually do the opposite of what the devil tries to do to me. When I get attacked financially, I give more. When I get attacked emotionally, I love more. When I'm discouraged, I encourage more. Because I want to do anything that's anti-culture to the devil's way. I'm a, so I, I, I believe in what you honour is what you receive from. So he walks through the dark of the evening and then... And then his servants came and said, your son is made well. And he said, when did that happen? They said, yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon. And Jesus, were, and, he, and the, the nobleman said, that was when Jesus had said that it would happen. It took him a night time to get to the, the result of the declaration and he could have given up and never heard the promise. See, so many people get to a point and they go, I can't go any further. I'm going over here or backsliding or turning back. And they never get to the point of receiving what God had actually called them to do because they stop walking towards the promise. They stop honouring, giving weight to what God said. As I said, I'm third generation preacher. Rudy, you can... Come wherever you are. Musicians can come. I'm third generation preacher. I was insecure, as I said at the beginning. I had the enemy say, you're nothing. And I had God say, you're something. I had two voices. And whatever voice I honoured is the voice that directed my life. Whatever voice I gave value to is the voice that I walk towards. So in the moment of insecurity, I have the word of God. So I decide to say, God, no, you've called me to be a champion. You've called me to be a winner. You've called me to be the head and not the tail. You called me to be above and not beneath. So I honor what you say. I honor your word over my life. The doctors come in and they say, you will, not get weather, uh, you will not get better. I have a choice. So I honour a fact or honour the truth of God's word. By his stripes I am healed. The bank balance looks grim. So I have a choice. I honour, I'm going to give to the Lord and let him open the windows of heaven and rebuke the devourer or I'm going to live in fear. By the way, fear is faith in the devil. It's really what it is. You believe his power more, over, more than God's power. So there I was and didn't feel I could do anything. And you know the thing about God's promises, they always have to be attacked to prove that they're his promises. There always has to be two trees in the garden. There always has to be because God gives you a choice whether what you're going to honour is what you're going to live by. Always. Because he has to show to the devil you're not a robot, you have free will, 
And here's the, here's the thing about God making man. The Bible says that we are lower than the angels. What, who was the king angel of heaven? Lucifer. He was the worship leader of heaven. And he turns a third of the angels against God. One time I was discouraged because I had a few people who had left the church and I was like, is there something wrong with me, God? He said, am I the perfect leader? This is what God said to me. Am I the perfect leader? I said, yes, you are. He said, is heaven the perfect environment? He, I said, yes, it is. He said, I even had a third of my congregation leave. And see, God gave the devil the domain of the earth. And he says, I'm going to release my children on the earth who I have put lower than the angels. And I'm going to empower them with this thing called honour, which then gives them faith, that they can make choices against your lies. And I'm going to use a lesser being in your eye, a lesser being in your eye, not in my eye, but in the, in the devil's eye, that you think you're higher than them, but you watch what I do through them is greater than what you could ever do. Because there's two trees in the garden and when they choose the tree that I've called them to live by, the promises of God, watch what I can do with them. Every time we honour God, we give the devil a punch in the head. Every time we honour the truth of God's Word, every time we honour people and the God that's in people, we actually... See, people preach on unity. If there's honour, unity is there. Last thing I say is, where does honour start? People often say, you've got to honour your father. We think the children is where honour starts. Actually, honour starts with the father. God honoured us by sending His Son. He valued us first. And then the Son said, here I am, valued the Father. And then we come to God by valuing what the Son did, who honours the Father. Honour starts with the Father. And if you have the Spirit of the Father living in you, you're a Christian, you should be the one setting honour in your workplace, in your home place, in your, in your street, in your high rise, wherever, in your church, in your cell group. Because if you have the Spirit of Father, it's not about age, it's about having the Spirit of the Father. I'm telling you, if we understand honour, we understand we have the key that releases faith. Because honour and faith are best friends. There's a whole heap more I could talk about how the Trinity work and all that. But this is such a crucial thing because sometimes we've you as leaders across the world, we've taught honour to control people and try to get them to do things. Well, you must honour us. That, that, no, that's control, intimidation and manipulation. No, a true kingdom person is somebody who releases greatness. There's order in honour, but there's greatness in honour. I don't have time to speak about that, but here's, here's what I want to leave with you. Sorry, I've, I'm an Australian that's gone on. What are you honouring today? Because everybody honours something. You either honour unbelief or belief. Because what you honour is what you give weight to, it's what you receive from. Maybe you're needing a miracle and you've started doubting. Why don't you honour what God says? Maybe there's a relationship that is in trouble and, and, and maybe you need to honour forgiveness. Give weight to it. Do something about it. Maybe you're looking for a financial breakthrough and, and you've held back from the Lord and God's saying, honour me with your wealth, uh, your first fruits, and see what I'll do. I, I really want to encourage you. Don't let this just be a slogan this year. Honour it. I remember one year I said to my church, it's a year of supernatural. And I was in a meeting and I said, God's healing blind eyes here, people with eyesight. And we got a lot of university students, so a lot of glasses. And there was this man for 20 years, for 20 years, had come to older call after older call after older call for his eyesight. 20 years, never seen a miracle, but he kept honouring God and saying, no, I believe God, I believe. Never saw it in 20 years. 
Because 20 years before, he, had, he was on a lathe and a piece of wood gone up from the lathe and hit him in the eye. And he lost 90% of sight in his eye and he had to get a valve put in to stop gl glaucoma. And there he was for, for 20 years, 90% lost sight in one eye. And he came to Oldacle after Oldacle. What was he doing? Valuing the truth of God's Word, even though everything in the natural said it never was going to happen. 20 years. And I said, God's healing eyesights. He comes forward, got his hands raised. And he says, as he's got his hands raised, he sees a vision of a piece of wood flying up and a hand stopping it. He opens his eyes and he looks. He calls to his wife, come, come, come. He said, which one's my bad eye? She said, what do you mean? He said, I can see. And then she looked into his eye and saw the valve had been supernaturally removed. He was completely healed and healed to this day. What about if he stopped responding? What about if he stopped coming to altar calls and said, well, I'm just going to honour unbelief and disappointment. I would never have been able to tell you the miracle and it would never have told you, it would never have changed his lifestyle. What have you been asking God for? Would you honour what God says? Would you look beyond people's external look for the God that's in them? Because if we do that together, church, see, DUMC and Dr. Daniel honoured Planet Shakers by allowing us to use this facility. They honoured us and honoured this nation. And out of that, uh, around 4,000 young people were here last night who had encounters with God and heaven was released on earth through a man who honoured the gift that was in little old Russell Evans from Planet Shakers. And out of that, thousands, and then the result will be tens of thousands of people touched. That's how honour works. That's how it works. So in this place, you say that I've walked to the towards some doubt and unbelief, but today I'm going to walk to truth. I've walked towards disappointment, but I, today I'm going to walk to belief. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. And we're going to pray, and I'm going to hand back to whoever is... Um, whatever's going to happen now. But if you say, I, I, there's things I've got to realign my giving weight to honouring what God says. And if that's you, you need a miracle in an area and say, I'm going to honour what God says about that. Would you stand to your feet wherever you are? Thank you for your honesty and vulnerability. Would you put your hands out towards you? Someone's throat's being healed right now. Someone has a, a, a throat, a lump in a throat. God's healing your throat. A blood disease is being healed right now. Someone who has a blood disease, you're being healed right now. Father, our hands are raised, our hearts are open. We come into agreement with your word. We honour you. Father, we, we cut off disappointment, we cut off unbelief, and we release heaven on earth. We thank you for the key to unlock faith in our life and to release a currency to bring miracles and breakthroughs. Father, I speak blessing and favour. We rebuke the devourer, we rebuke the lies of the enemy, and we release favour and truth. I declare over this house that this year we honour a stretching, a spreading out, a thinking big. We honour what God says about us and about this nation of Malaysia. Lord, we don't look at the natural, we look at what you say. And you, if we come into agreement with the kingdom of God and we declare over this house, the greatest days are ahead of this house, the greatest days are ahead of the church in this nation. And we give you praise and we give